Okay, thanks, uh, Mick. So we'll throw it open to the floor now. Um, can I ask that you, uh, when you put your hand up and ask a question, please give us your name and your affiliation, uh, and we'll try to uh, fit in as many questions as we can. Who'd like to kick off proceedings? No one? Okay. That, yes, please. I'm Mark Swift, farmer from New South Wales. Um, Rob. Um, going against the trend of hopper, um, frost is costing us, you know, dry land grain systems far more money than we will ever ever lose from people because we manage the length of fallow to reduce this very drought um, in order to keep more, retain moisture in our system. But the trend that we've noticed, and particularly kicked off since the, um, probably the 90s, is our frost events are getting far more extreme and late with the season. Um, I'm wondering if you would comment on what impact is the change in land use having in that? When we've had, from that period, an end of the reserve of rice grain, which has taken 180 or million sheep out of the landscape, and a part is <coughs> um, a change to continuous cropping, particularly the winter continuous cropping, so we've got high biomass indexes at that time of year, and the impact that that can have on a local land Okay, I, um, so, so firstly, um, I'll talk to you afterwards and give you Steve Crimp's details. So Steve Crimp from CSIRO is actually looking at this question of some of the climate drivers explaining that change, that, that change in frost. And I think, to my simple understanding, some of that is just these drier springs are contributing to some of that. In terms of land use, certainly the frosts that do a lot of damage to our wheat are these radiation frosts. And it is true that the thickest crop, so the coldest place on a night, on a clear night, is the top of the canopy. And a really thick, that sort of really thick crop that you can almost walk across is, is, is a bigger problem rather than the edges of the crop and so on. So I think within a paddock, there's a component to that versus um, the land use area in terms of grazing versus cropping and so on. I would rank that down down the factor compared to these climate drivers and some of the um, what is otherwise really healthy crops. Rob, did you want to add anything to that? Or? No, um, maybe just one other point. It's just to note that um, the shifting temperature distributions, the timing of warm weather um, is, is affecting things like the, the timing of uh, bud burst and the like. Um, and that's, in fact, I think what happened with the grapes here and around Canberra uh, in the spring here. So they, uh, they burst quite a bit earlier and brought them into the frost window. So those shifting, the shifting timing of the temperature is a, is, is a big issue. Um, yeah, it's the only other thing that I think worth mentioning. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, I'm from India, I'm Dr. Garvinda Mali, and I'm from uh, Sanjay, working with Sanjay and Smart Clock and with the new field. So I'm, uh, it's a hot topic of global warming. I'm dealing with billion of farmers in my area, so we have a big issue with 1% temperature increase they reduce the yield of uh, wheat crop. So what uh, you people are uh, concerned about the coming time is very, because temperature is changing a lot, and uh, our farmers are really worried. I mean, think global farmers are worried. So what uh, you view about this global warming and temperature increase by day by day on the cropping like the barley, wheat and others sometimes reduce the yield up to 10% uh, also, 15%. So we are really big issue with this. So how are you, what do you view about this? <laughs> Look, I, I can't comment on the agriculture stuff. I'll let, I'll let Peter uh, comment on that. But, but just to talk a little bit about the global warming experience, I suppose. Um, it's very, very evident that we're shifting things, as I've said in my talk. Uh, it's a, roughly a degree warmer. Um, the extremes are being affected. That, that the current level of change that we've observed is now locked in. It's locked in for hundreds, if not thousands of years, even if we halt emissions tomorrow. So adaptation strategies have to commence now. Luckily, they are underway quite extensively. But um, the other thing to point out is that we, are, we remain on an emissions uh, pathway that is inviting 
a lot more, in fact, accelerating levels of change in terms of those temperatures. And if you take the, the worst case scenario of the highest emissions um, from the IPCC uh, reports, um, you know, we're really talking about something four to five degrees warmer on average. Now, that's just the average. Uh, when you contemplate the extremes associated with that, it's a, it's a pretty confronting idea. So, um, yeah, people are right to be concerned. People are right to be planning for the future and thinking through adaptation strategies right now. But there's probably a larger task for the whole world to think, think also about the, the mitigation side of the story as well. Just really quickly, at, um, at three to four degrees, there's a whole lot of huge problems. In the early stages of warming over the coming decades, I think the warmer winters will change crop development, but we can solve that with different varieties to a, to a large extent. The, the worrying but most uncertain area is what it's going to do to rainfall, especially in southern Australia. And that's that, that, but the, the, another real concern is how is that warming going to be delivered in spring heat events? And, and there's, a, there's, there's a major warming there. This really interesting interaction with frost is, an, is another factor of that. Yes. Uh, could you just identify yourself, please? Thank you. I, I, uh, really quickly on the second question, I can't see the cost effectiveness of any treatment um, realistically for the sort of yields we're dealing with across most of the, of the Australian grains belt. Um, in terms of genetic, y yes there is work in that. I think it's important to acknowledge that a severe frost is going to wipe out everything. But these more moderate frost and even the threshold problem of some of the cold temperatures versus the frost, so there's a, which is a complicated thing. Talking to Jason Eglinton, barley breeder, they're pretty confident about this, including this, this phenotyping work, which will, in the short term, give some of this variety information, but in the longer term, they can use that for breeding. So there is, there is some interest, there's some Japanese varieties and so on that, that, that are, have quite some interest for that. Again, in Australia, we're dealing with these spring frosts rather than in America and Japan and so on, where they're dealing with extreme frost during the, during the growing season. Whereas, whereas here, what we're dealing with is a fairly warm environment and then bang, and a, a, an October frost. Okay, there's a question down the front. Um, so Rob Norman from CNH Capital. Uh, question for uh, Michael. You mentioned that the controlled burning of the bush, for the bush has, uh, has reduced by 50%. Is that, a, is that a statement to say they're trying to reduce the emissions, the CFL emissions? Or is that just something else that, that, uh, that you've taken from one? Yeah. You won't have a catastrophic event. I'd need, I need to check the 50%, actually. It might, it's probably in the order of 30 to 50. I'd need to double check. But it's, it's a quite a large decline. And it's mainly uh, related to probably regulation around the ability to be able to do it. Secondly, it's resources in terms of costs. The, the, the state, I mean, a lot of forestry is, is managed by state agencies, a whole range of them. They don't necessarily have the resources to do it. And, and the other factor is a narrow window of opportunity to do the burns in terms of we're seeing shifts in climate and the ability to, to do it safely. And then there's issues around smoke uh, and, and air quality. That's why we're really interested in these types of other approaches where it's a combination of burning with, with mechanical uh, removal and harvest or slashing. Uh, so it's really been a resourcing issue and probably some issues around regulation which is what the US were actually trying to deal with, trying to simplify the ability to undertake more burning. Next question. Okay, I'll, I've got one. I guess that what struck me, I think Mick was, oh, sorry, Danielle, sorry, please feel free. It's been a long plane flight, Danny, for sitting here. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, bananas have been grown in the ord in the past and, and <laughs> are probably the, uh, the victim of a volatile climate. So temperatures regularly get in excess of 40 degrees. We're getting thermal heat damage, um, major quality defects. As far as freight and logistics go, you may as well be on the moon. You're as far from anywhere as the major markets. Um, <laughs> you can. <laughs> uh, no, but it's, it, it, there is some production that's gone back there. But the other one too is, you know, we talked about uh, the susceptibility to wind. Uh, my presentation was on tropical cyclones, but one of the things the Ord was dealing with every year were these major monsoonal thunderstorms. And so I think the, the figures I saw were on average about a third of the production in the Ord was being wiped out every year um, by thunderstorm wind damage. So in the end it just became uh, uh, economically unviable to grow bananas so far from your major markets under such extreme climates. So um, you just need a really moderate, humid, lowland, tropical climate and, uh, and unfortunately Australia doesn't have a lot of that. Any other? Uh, yes. Hi, Yeah, um, I guess it's, it, it's uh, really around the wind strength issue. So if you're talking about low wind strength type events, um, 100, 120 k, maybe up to 150 k an hour, uh, yes, there, there are probably opportunities to try and mitigate some of that. Uh, once you get into the severe categories like we had with Larry and, and Yassi, um, you're picking your, your wind breaks up out of your plantation um, and that was one of the big issues, uh, even you know, 50, 60 kilometres inland in Cyclone Larry on the Atherton Tablelands where they grow a lot of orchard crops. They spent months um, trying to renovate large um, timber windbreaks which had just been utterly destroyed. Because you're talking wind speeds that were in excess of 200 kilometres an hour. So at those speeds, um, nothing survives. Certainly not, not close to the centre in, in the core. Um, uh, as you get further out, of course, your wind speed drops off and so your opportunities for uh, mitigation are improved but I mean you don't know, you don't know if it's going to be a direct impact, you don't know if you're going to be on the edge. Um, you know I've had, I've got some friends now who, whose house have been run over three times in the last 30 years by a category three storm or bigger and they're getting a bit sick of it and you know, replacing their roofs and their guttering and their windows and their doors. So yeah it's, um, yes the answer is yes you can mitigate it but only to a point. Any final questions from the audience? Yeah, please. Go for it. Uh, yeah, my uh, Tim Gavin from uh, Nuffield, Scotland, in Victoria, uh, pushing the mic. Uh, recently, saw a rise in the Grand Pickens region um, and they've broken out straight into farmland, and farmers have went for the cost of operating, you know, creating fire breaks. Is there an opportunity or support from government you know, to do more to put fire breaks into you know, state parks, national parks, to sort of ease the, ease the pressure on them? Well, we would certainly support that uh, as an industry and a stakeholder. But that part, of, part of the issue has been lack of infrastructure for, that, for the ability to access and fight those fires. And that was my point about we've seen a land shift of land tenure where you had a lot of that infrastructure. Uh, and again, it can be issues around resourcing for management of these increasingly large formal reserves that don't, haven't been adequately resourced. And part of what the US are doing is looking at uh, doing some partnerships with industry where you can, uh, you may be able to have some uh, income and sales of some of that material you're removing to help fund fund those activities. So it's a, it's a combination of uh, the again the state agency's responsibility and where their funding's coming from. But we think there's some novel approaches where you could you could do some p participation with industry and help with some of those issues around uh, the infrastructure that you need. Thanks. Any one last one? No. Well, we might, we've, we've just gone over our time, but I would like to thank uh, all our speakers today. Um, I think it's been a really interesting uh, range of presentations from Rob, Stuart, Peter and, and Mick. Um, a lot of food for thought. Um, thank you for your time and uh, please enjoy lunch. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a handbook that was done for